Okay, um, I'm Mick Higgins uh, from Exacom. Uh, Exacom focuses in delivering solutions to improve organizations in the field of project controls through our consultancy and training. And we focus on three key areas, um, that's earned value management, scheduling and planning, and risk management. So I'm here to talk today about my experience out in Lithuania on the Ignalina nuclear power plant. So the Ignalina nuclear power plant, so whereabouts is it? Um, it's based in Lithuania. So it's based in the north of Lithuania and it's very close to the Latvia and Belarus border. Um, it's based just outside a town uh, called Fizigenas um, and the surrounding areas are, are surrounded by natural beauty, forests, lakes. Um, one of the best places that I visited while I was out there was um, the, the city, um, Vilnius, the capital. Is it the architecture, the places to go and see is absolutely stunning. So if we look at a brief history of Ignalina, so preparations for the site um, construction started in 1974. So it was about four years after the field work began um, and unit one came online in 1983. So the original plan was to have four units. Um, they actually only constructed two units because of, as they had to close the power plant down as part of uh, the accession to the European Union. Because the power plant itself was um, the same design as Chernobyl, and after the Chernobyl disaster, um, there were concerns from the European Union um, about operating a very similar design. And so they were asked to decommission as part of the Lithuanian joining uh, the European Union. So the decommissioning activities are scheduled to 2038. So it's, it's an incredibly big mega project. Um, the overall value, I think, is around about 1.2 billion euros. And um, whilst I was out there, anyhow, um, the town itself that the power plants built nearby is a town called Visaginas, and that was founded in 1975. This was purpose-built town to support the, the build um, of the power plant and also to support the operation of the power plant once constructed. So in terms of the dismantling, so th this is a huge project. So you've got to think you, you're going to be dismantling not only the reactor core, you're not only going to be dismantling buildings, you've got all the liquid to consider, you've got all the surrounding buildings to consider. It's an absolute mammoth task. So really there's, there's six key phases to dismantling around the reactor unit. So you've got the emergency core cooling system and storage tanks, turbine generation halls and all the auxiliary systems with that. We react to gas circuits and venting systems, low salt water and main coolant bypass water systems, the control room, all the electrical equipment, um, and the reactor building itself. But prior to doing that, we need to remove um, the spent nuclear fuel from the reactor cells themselves. So once we start pulling this thing apart, once we start decommissioning it, it's where do we put all this waste? What do we do with the waste? So the, the several key projects that I was exposed to and involved with um, in terms of new builds and existing builds of where we're going to store or treat radioactive waste. So one of the biggest ones was where we were going to put the spent nuclear fuel. So basically we're, we're looking at the rods from the reactor. So the operation of this started in May 2017. Um, and the facility itself had the capability of storing 17,000 fuel assemblies. So these fuel assemblies were lifted out of the reactor itself um, by a, a computer controlled robot and put into almost like these huge gigantic Coke cans, um, a bit more advanced than Coke cans. So we'd fill these up with reactor rods. The casks would then be loaded via um, a system of cranes and platforms onto um, the transport system, which is basically a railway line train system, and then they'd be transported to what they call the dry storage area. So essentially, you, you'd end up on completion of this with a total of 190 casks um, actually stored in this unit, and I think there was there was another cask ordered as well as a, as a spare. So all the all the fuel is planned transportation completion. So the, the interim spent nuclear fuel storage, or B1 as we knew it should actually be full by um, the third quarter of 2022. And it'll operate for 50 years until we decide what we can do with the nuclear fuel as part of the next stage. So that was one of the projects that we were involved with. 
Another project was something we called B234. And this was looking at how we were going to manage the solid waste. So how we'd manage that, how we'd store it, um, and, and what we'd do with it. So this was really split into two projects. You've got B2, which was designed for retrieval of the solid waste of existing storage facilities. So obviously over the years, you know, we've accumulated some solid waste and it's been stored in other units. We now need to move that and decide what we're going to be doing with it. Um, B2 is designed for really very low to low level waste. Um, and that will be packaged and transported to something called B19, which is um, another facility, which I'll go into on another slide in a minute, which is a facility for temporary storage. Um, and so that could be moved into a, um, an underground facility for storage. So low to medium waste would be transported to the B34 facility for further treatment. So they'd look at treating this and breaking the material down whether it would be shredding, whether it would be incineration, whether it would be chemical treatment. And then they'd look at packing that material up um, and then sending it to another project called something called B25, um, which is a slightly above ground unit um, where they'd be storing that again um, for 50 years. So I mentioned before the B19 facility. So it's, comprises of two areas. So there's the buffer storage unit, which was known as B19-1. Um, this is the interim storage unit. So once this storage unit gets to a capacity of full capacity, there's 15 campaigns planned. And each of those uh, campaigns will dispose of um, a, a number of, well, a package of the fuel um, with very low level wastes. And that will be transported to the landfill repository, which is known as B19-2. So B19-1, it was in operation since 2013 and 19-2 construction work started in June 2017. Okay, again, I mentioned something called B25. So this is a near surface repository. So this is where some of the, the low level to medium high waste will be stored for 50 years. So again, it's split into two elements. So B25-1 was really the research to do with the geology um, of the area that the, the planning was proposed to go in. So this was looking at um, you know, seismic activity, confirmation that it was suitable for construction, looking at the engineering and hydro geo, geo, geology to make sure it was uh, you know, good to go. So B25-2, has actually gone out for tender. So it went out for tender this year in March, 2020. Um, and the current forecast for construction will be between 2023 and 2024. So that's currently where that is. But on completion of this, you know, th these will be filled up with casks of nuclear waste for, for about 50 years to come. So our involvement, I mean, we're project controls uh, specialists. So we, we were involved in helping with the project schedule coaching uh, and consulting. And we were looking at delay analysis and impact analysis with the contractors we were using in case we got into any debates in line with some of the contracts we have. We looked at schedule quality assessments, make sure that the schedules that were being produced were you know, good order and the earned value management that the guys have implemented out there, um, some additional coaching and consulting, and looking at some of the risk management software and going through a down select process for that. I mean, it has to be said, we, we weren't out there teaching everybody exactly what to do. They've, they've made so much progress already. I think we were really there as a bit of a buffer um, and also to help people take them and learn maybe to the next stage. But they, they'd set up things like, P6 schedules for all the projects. They were running their value management already when we got there. Um, and they were you know, reasonably mature in their, their approach to risk management, but they wanted to take it into more of an enterprise environment. So yeah, some interesting times whilst I was out there as well. Um, obviously the, at times there, there were international tensions that were becoming high, especially between um, NATO organizations and Russia. Um, so the, there was sometimes it was out there and we're thinking, you know, things like the 75 page guide on how to deal with a foreign invasion came out, which was a bit concerning as a UK consultant based out there. 
Um, and a, another odd thing that happened was I was on a trip down to the local supermarket one day and uh, NATO rolled into town uh, because they were on training exercises. So there was all this project going on, which was a real international collaboration across the European Union from private investors to the ERBD, European Union funding, um, to this NATO uh, potential conflict with Russia. Um, so it was, it was quite an interesting uh, time to be working out there. And I think that the other thing to note as well is um, the picture on the, the left-hand side on my screen um, is basically the view I had out from the office window, from the office that I worked. Um, so when the HBO series of the Chernobyl series was on, it, it was quite strange seeing uh, the, the reactor uh, that used to sit outside my window being used um, to computer model um, some of the sequences. So it, it, it was quite strange to see that, but also an incredibly interesting series. So that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for your time.